Thank you so much for joining us today. We are so excited as we continue our series, Seeds of Thanks. Today we are talking about how life multiplies in the overflow. Let's see what Pastor Brian has to say. God has designed life to begin from a seed. From what is planted comes much fruit and much harvest. At this time of year, our hearts are turned to what we are thankful for. What we have received began somewhere as a seed, a gift, a word, a moment that changed us. Maybe this year, out of our thankfulness, we should plant some seeds. Maybe we should be the ones who give a gift speaks a word of hope or gives our time away so that someone else could know the fruit of thankfulness. Maybe it's time that we became seeds. Amen. Glad you're here today. Special day ahead for us. You'll probably notice Caleb absent from the stage today. He went home Tuesday not feeling well and is really still struggling. Something flu-like for sure. So I appreciate your prayers for him and Brianna and uh, Ashton as they all seek to get him well. What a day. What a... Uh, what a day last week was here at Vertical. You know, it was, a, it was a day we had a lot of plans for. We had planned to baptize that day. Had one of those moments or mornings where everything just went awry. The, the tank that morning developed this massive hole in the side that we couldn't even use. We had to uh, not do baptism last week. We had the terrible sewer issues. Couldn't even really, you know, invite people onto campus. And you probably were greeted outside and said, hey, no services today. Go home and watch online. And a lot, a lot of people did. Uh, We had many, many accounts watching online, but over 100 people stayed and said, we're going to be here anyway, in spite of no childcare and no bathrooms. So, man, that was awesome. Way to go, everybody that stuck in there last week. We had a great time, but I'm glad you're here this week, and I'm glad we have restrooms. And it's a good thing. It's a very good thing. You know, it's a beautiful thing to see lives changed, to see hearts that were once resistant, stubborn, and refusing to become soft, to become open to God, to yield themselves to God, to see a mind in someone that has been racked with confusion and racing thoughts and trouble to all of a sudden hear the words of Jesus and come to a place of peace and have their thoughts settled. To see someone whose emotions have been out of control to come to a place of health and healing in their emotions and rest there. To see men who have accepted the call to be godly men, to see women who have accepted the responsibility to be God-honoring women, to see them come to that place in their life and God bless, that is a beautiful thing. And it is happening right here in our church. The stories of people in this room right now who are walking with Christ and finding hope in him in ways they have never experienced before. To find new truth that brings peace, new life that settles the the troubles, and to see restoration happen in their marriage, in their family. Those are beautiful things. This is what God intends to happen when his word is sown like seed. It lands in our hearts, it grows, it produces fruit, and it begins to spill over into the lives of others. God has designed life to multiply in that way so that it comes up and produces seed through fruit and it leaves me and it goes into someone else's life. Fruit of the Spirit, filled with the seed of truth, lands in someone else's life, and it produces new life. This is God's plan. He multiplies life through seed. Our series is called, is called Seeds of Thanks, and we are looking at what it means to be a people who sow seeds from our lives to create heart change in the lives of others. Of others. 
Life only multiplies when there's fruit that has seed in it. Life doesn't multiply if there is no fruit and no seed. This is God's design for agriculture. It's his design for us as humans. It's his design for faith as well. God has imprinted the law of the seed into all of creation, and we're going to look at what that means today as we think about how does life spread in a family? How does love grow in a family? How do you pass on to your children what you have experienced in faith? How do you see that leave you as a spouse and go to your spouse? How do you see life and love multiply there? How do you see that happen among friends? How does that happen in a community from a church? It all comes down to the law of the seed. If you've got your Bibles today or you have a Bible app, turn to 2 Corinthians 9. This is where we're working from today. 2 Corinthians 9, New Testament. We see what God has to say about the law of the seed. God is moving a man named Paul, who is a leader in the New Testament church. He has planted churches and he is writing to a church in Corinth where Corinthians was written to so that they could be encouraged about what it means to know this law of the seed. You see, there were believers living in Jerusalem who were going through persecution and suffering. And so the apostle Paul is making his way around to churches and cities in the area, letting others know about the troubles in Jerusalem. And he's collecting an offering along the way from those who want to give and support and help those believers. And so he writes to these believers in Corinth to help them be a part of the blessing. He wanted them to share in it. So 2 Corinthians 9 is where we start today. And he gives some powerful principles here that work if you're a farmer and they work if you're a person of faith. They work in a family as well. I'm starting in verse 6. The Apostle Paul says this, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now, I realize that sowing and reaping are not things that we necessarily do in here. In fact, by trade in this room, there may only be two people that would call themselves farmers today. Is that true? Who would say you do the work of farming? There they are right here. The millers are the only ones. You see, back in the days this was written, and in early days in America, that would have been perhaps one of the most common trades in the room. Everyone would have understood sowing and reaping. And it has an effect on you, really. If you're a farmer, it affects how you think in a really good way, Tim. I'm really saying that's a good thing. Because when you learn what it means to plant seed and to care for that seed, to water that seed and to wait for that seed and then see it germinate and produce life and then fruit, that has an effect on you. It helps you learn some lessons about life, some lessons that you and I really kind of struggle with today. We are much more about go get it now. I don't even have to drive to Walmart anymore. I can get my phone out. I can go to Amazon. I can click buy, and tomorrow about the same time, it'll show up at my door. Someone brings it to me. I didn't have to get out of my pajamas to order it, and I don't have to get out of my pajamas to get it. It just comes to me. It is a crazy day in which we live. It's awesome to be able to do that. But it messes with your thinking, too. It changes all of us. It brings us to a place where we expect... I want, I get, pretty quick. I want it now, I get it now. We don't like to have to go to a restaurant, sit in a drive through line for more than five minutes. I'm talking about me, that is, you know. You may be different, you know. Maybe you like sitting in line for 20 minutes, some, some you know, drive through restaurant. Mm-mm. I'm gonna drive 20 more minutes to go sit in for one for three minutes, you know. I, that's just me. It's crazy. We're crazy like that. That's what, that's what modern day thinking does to you, though. You want something, you get something. And you have to wait for something, you know, all 
breaks loose. It's just terrible. It's just what we, we've come accustomed to. But farmers think differently. They are more accustomed to having a vision, doing some work, and waiting. Patiently waiting and waiting. They know what it means to sow. And I don't mean needle and thread sow. Farmers know that sowing means planting. When seed is in your hand and seed leaves your hand and goes into the ground and is covered over, sowing. They also know reaping. They know that after time has passed, after the seed has germinated, after the seed has grown, after this plant has has been through the rain season, after this plant has received some light, after this seed has bloomed, after this seed has begun to produce fruit, that it finally produces fruit, and then comes the time to reap what you have sown. So when the Apostle Paul here says, I want to lay out a law for you that's true in agriculture and in faith. It's also true in relationships. It's true in life. If you sow sparingly, in other words, if you only plant a little, if you say, I know I've got this much seed, but I'm only going to plant a little, then what you'll get back is a little. But if you sow bountifully with blessing, with muchness, with passion, with joy, if you put out a lot, you're going to get a whole lot. It just works that way with farming and with faith and giving and relationships. The amount you sow will determine the amount that you reap. And Paul lays out this significant principle here. He's saying life multiplies when there's overflow. We talked about a couple weeks ago, how fruit is overflow. This orange was the overflow of an orange tree. It was the fruit that came from it. And inside the fruit is where the seed is. So when life overflows from us, fruit overflows from us, it contains the potential for that life to multiply, to expand, And if you are stingy with what you have, you will not get much in return. If you hold on to more than you overflow, then you're going to be frustrated with the results that you see because you won't get much. If you only give a little, you won't get much. That's true when it comes to faith. It's true when it comes to family. It's true when it comes to farming. The principle works because God has written it into the fiber of creation. If you never overflow your faith, if it never is a subject that you talk about with other people, if you are sparing with it, then the people around you who come to know Christ through faith will be small in number. If you only overflow a little, there'll be little in return. But if your life is bountiful in describing, talking about, and loving Jesus through what you do, then there will be return, and it'll be bountiful return. If you're loving in your family, and you demonstrate Christ's love to those around you, you will produce And have produced a family that knows and understands love. Because life multiplies through the overflow. If you are stingy with your love, if you are selfish, if you're reserved, if you say, well, I don't talk about my heart very much and my feelings. I'm sad for you. Because you can't have life multiplied around you if it's not overflowing from you. You can't overflow Love that, or you can't have it multiplied if you're not overflowing it. You're not going to see faith multiplied if you're not overflowing it. If faith is never talked about in your home, if you're the mom and dad and faith is not a subject in your home, how can you expect your children 
to have a desire to want to know this faith that you have if it never overflows from you. Life multiplies from what is overflowing in you. If we want to see the presence of God here when we gather, then what we do is we gather and we let his love overflow from us. We do that as we sing. We do so with joy, with gratefulness, with passion. And then the presence of God is observed and seen and known by all because life multiplies in the overflow. But if we are stingy with our worship, if we are stingy with our praise, if we are sparing with our expressions, then there will be very little sense of God's presence in the room because life multiplies in the overflow. Are you with me? This is a pattern. This is a principle that God has written in to all of creation. And if you have very little that's overflowing from your life, whether it be peace or joy or love or faith, then you'll have very little of those things in your life. The less overflow, the less fruit. The more overflow, the more fruit. Let's take this orange again, for example. So in a typical orange are usually about three seeds. The seed is always in the overflow. The potential for new life is always in the overflow. Let's just say we took one of those seeds and we planted it. One seed. We would produce one tree as a result. Did you know that when a tree is mature, it has the potential for producing 300 oranges annually? One seed, 300 oranges annually. If a tree, an orange tree, were to live 50 years, which it is capable of, and it produced fruit for those 50 years, you would have 15,000 oranges produced in the life of that tree. And it all started with one seed. One seed from one fruit overflow produced 15,000 more just like it. Life multiplies in the overflow. That is the call that you and I have to be believers who overflow life. We live out our faith. That is why the statement is so critical for us as vertical church. Lift him up and live him out. Overflow him because life multiplies in the overflow. If this room is the only place during the week that you express any level of faith, then this room will be all that we ever see multiplied. But if we walk outside these walls and we live out our faith and we overflow in our marriage and we overflow in our parenting and we overflow at work and we overflow on the highway and we overflow in our own personal faith, excuse me, in our own personal faith, then we will see overflow happen to others. Others will be changed. Our first principle this morning is this. If you're taking notes or want to take a picture of the screen, life multiplies through what overflows from us. Only then can there be life that is multiplied from us. Let's make some more practical application here. Let's talk about parenting, for example. You have a child or children. You want them to know God. You want them to know what Jesus has done. You want them to one day understand the presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. You want your life that you have been given by Christ to multiply to them. How do you do that? Do you just force them to do Christian things? Well, in the early years, you do some of that. Not forcing, but you shape behavior by attending church, 
teaching them patterns for praying, reading scripture, singing Bible songs. You make this part of life. But how do you make sure that it actually transfers? So that when the time comes that they can make a decision on their own, they actually choose to make that decision. That they're not just doing it because you have guilted them or making them afraid or you're critical of them. How do you make sure that that life really transfers? Remember, life multiplies in the overflow. Okay? So if you want that to happen, then out of the overflow of your heart has to come love for your children. That means you have to conscientiously conscientiously choose to not do some things. Not to say that your children are a bother. Not to complain about your children. Not to frustrate your children. Not to be bitter against your children. Not to be a poor example for your children. But instead, choosing to love them by faith and choose to train them up to be men and women of God to be intentional and know that you are overflowing in their lives, you are shaping, correcting, adjusting, sharpening so that they can be arrows for the Lord sent out to accomplish what he has purposed and they desire it in their heart. This happens when love overflows from you and life overflows from you. The same thing happens in your finances. You want to see God present in your finances? Then it means there must be an overflow that honors him. An overflow that gives to him. So that you choose to take a portion of what he has blessed you with and you return it to him. The Bible calls the the most basic part of that a tithe. A 10% starting point of where you say, God, you have given me all things. It is all yours. But I honor you by giving this 10% tithe as an act of worship back to you. It's not a, a law that he beats us over the head with, but it is a principle established and written into the fiber of the universe. When you honor him with the first fruits of all your increase, He will bless what is left. He'll bless all that you have. It all begins with the overflow, a desire to give, a desire that comes from your heart, a principle that applies in parenting, it applies in worship here in this space, it applies in finances, and it applies in serving other people. You notice when you come here to Vertical that there are a lot of people in place to intentionally serve you. That's by design. You're being served the minute you pull into the parking lot. Someone's helping you find a parking place. Someone's greeting you. Someone's helping you get to the door. Someone's helping you when you come in. Someone's helping you find a seat. Someone's helping you with a coffee bar. Someone's helping you if you drop your children off. You are being served throughout the whole process that you are here. That is by design. We want you to see that this is exactly what Christ does for us. He serves us, and out of the overflow, the joy, you are experiencing that here. And so what we encourage those who are our members to do is to do the same thing. Find a place where you can overflow here. We want you to serve here. We want you to be in a place where you can glorify God and show someone else the overflow of your life. So I mentioned to you a couple weeks back that our, um, our children's ministry is one of those areas in our church right now that is overflowing, mm-hmm. literally. It is overflowing. We have classes this morning that are overflowing with children. So we are working on a plan where January 1st, we will multiply our classes because we need to get the ratios down of children to leader in the room where the children can enjoy the time and the leader can go home sane. It's necessary. It's important, right? Because you have to know how many plants you've got to cultivate here and you've got to be able to get to all of them. So God has blessed us with overflow of children. Way to go, moms and dads. Keep that up. So it's our work then as the church, as we are raising children up in faith, to give ourselves to serving So what you're going to hear a little bit later today 
is an opportunity where you can sign up to be a part of that. With our service, the way it is structured right now, we have one service and children are meeting at the same time. So we ask volunteers to give one Sunday out of six to work upstairs and serve in children's ministry to make a difference in the lives of those birth through fourth grade. And Micah will be able to help you with that later today, help you know where you can plug in and serve. It is a way that out of overflow, we can see life multiply, and that's our calling as a church. Amen? We want to do that. We want to help the next generation know who Jesus is. We want to help the next generation know about the Bible, how to know God, how to live out what we are lifting up. That is what we do. We serve, and God blesses when we serve out of overflow. Now, the Scripture gives us some more insight here as we think about this law of the seed. Verse 7 says this. It says, So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Mm. The Holy Spirit is saying here, when you give, serve, love, do so from a place of passion in your heart. Don't do so out of a sense of, well, I guess I've got to do this. Ugh. I've got to go serve. I've got to go give. Oh, those kids. Oh, that money. Oh, that whoever. If you're doing something grudgingly, or doing something out of necessity, in other words, you're doing it just because you're being forced to, or you're doing it because it's just a, a thing you have to do, let me assure you, there will be very, very little blessing that comes to you or anybody else if you're doing it grudgingly or out of necessity. If someone comes to you and they say, here, I got you a present. They told me I had to do it. How does that make you feel? You're like, oh, uh, thanks. You know, there's no life that multiplies in that moment because you may have done the deed, but the fruit didn't contain the seed. The seed is the desire. But if someone came to you and said, hey, I have a gift for you. And I just want you to know, I just appreciate you so much. And you're, you're a blessing to me, so I wanted to give this gift to you. What are you going to do in that moment? You're going to say, oh, really? Thank you so much. I'm just, I don't even know what to say. You see, in that moment, life just transferred from them to you. Because now you are all of a sudden filled with a desire that you didn't have before. Now you are instantly thinking, I probably should get them a gift. I got some people in my life I need to appreciate too. You see, life transferred. It wasn't necessarily in what you did. It was in how you did it. That's why this truth here is so powerful. When you give, let it be from a place of purpose in your heart. Not grudging. Not out of necessity. Because of this. Because God, he loves it when we give like him. That's what this verse is saying. God loves a cheerful giver. Here's our second principle today. God blesses those who give like him. When you love your spouse grudgingly or out of necessity, there is no life that transfers there. When you love your children grudgingly or out of necessity, there is no life transferred there. If you attempt to serve others, give, or worship grudgingly or out of necessity, no life transfer happens there. You did the deed. You did the fruit. But it was plastic and synthetic and there was no seed in it to create a multiplying of life. God blesses those who give like him, who give passionately, who give freely, who give without strings attached, who give without looking to see if you're going to give anything back to them, who give 
out of overflow. This is how God gave to us. Fruit that has seed multiplies. Now, I know what you're probably thinking, because I've thought this too. Well, I've got people in my life I'm loving. I've served them. I've done some things for them that they don't even realize I did for them, and they haven't changed yet. So how do I just keep on doing this thing when I'm not seeing any change yet? What if I feel like I'm about to run dry and I'm kind of done on giving out the fruit? I've given out all the fruit, it feels like, and I'm not getting anything in return. I'm glad you asked because Scripture answers it. Verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. It doesn't matter where you are, what the situation, how long you've been serving, God is the one who has the supply for what you need. You feel like you've run out of, out of fruit? You feel like you're out of seed? Then you need to come back to him because he is the one who can give you everything you need for all circumstances and have you abundantly ready for every good work. You have to return to him. He is the one who gives the abundance. So our next principle, God will give you an endless supply of fruit and seed. He will, if you return to him. Now, if you go once to him, and then you rush out and try to do your thing, and then you get frustrated, and you just keep standing there frustrated, waiting on that other person to respond, then you're missing the point. You went and planted some seed. It's time to go back and get some more. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you the rest. I'll give you what you need. Don't go to the people or the circumstances in your life expecting them to return to you. You go back to God and he is the one who returns to you. And he'll actually bring you to a place of having need. Hmm. Really? He will? Yes. Because he wants you to go pour yourself out for your spouse, your children, your employer, your friends, those you're serving, those you're ministering to. He wants you to pour yourself out so that you can come back to him and say, God, I'm so empty. And he says, good. I like empty vessels. Excuse me, I'm struggling today. I like empty vessels, God says, because empty vessels, I can fill up again. And he does. He wants us to come back to him and say, God, I need some more. And he says, good, because I'm able. I'm able to fill you. But I can't fill you if you won't come back to me. This is what God has written in to the fiber of creation. The scripture goes on in verse 9. It says this, And it is written, He has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. This is a reference from the Psalms about a, a, a person who is godly, seeking God's ways, and he goes out and he gives himself away. He pours himself out and he returns to God again and God gives him some more and he keeps going out and he keeps sowing seed and God keeps giving him more and it's a pattern he gets into and it says this man's righteousness It endures forever. He's not going to run out. It's not going to run dry. He's going to have what he needs in his soul to be able to give to the people in his life because God is able. Amen? Amen. Verse 10. Remember, Paul's writing here, and he gets kind of caught up. He gets a little excited. He writes a prayer for these people. He says, Now, may he who supplies seed to the sower... And bread for food. Supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality, in other words, generosity, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. Look at it again. Which causes, verse 11. 
which causes thanksgiving through us to God. Read it with me. Which causes thanksgiving through us to God. Do you see what happened? They gave and it caused something to happen. They planted from their overflow. They gave to those who were in need. And Paul says, it caused us to be thankful. It changed hearts. When you overflow, life multiplies. It's the pattern. When you plant the seed and you keep planting the seed and you water it and you wait, then God brings about a harvest. And the harvest here is heart change. They became thankful. Mm. That's why we've called this series Seeds of Thanks. So that this season we might have a different look at thanksgiving. It's one thing to make a list of all the things that God has provided for you this year and say, God, I'm so thankful. That's good, and that's right. But if it ends there, I'm not sure it is right. Because God has designed that life happen through overflow. And if you've become thankful then it is intended that that life and thankfulness in you overflow to someone else. If you've been given to, then you're called to give. If you've been forgiven, you're called to forgive. If you've been moved, then it is your call to express that, what God has put in your heart. Now, again, I'm a mind reader, of course, and I know what you're thinking next. I've done what you're talking about. I hear you. I've planted. I'm waiting. It hasn't happened yet. Hello, was I reading your mind this morning or not? Yeah, it happens. We get in this place where we think, I'm doing that, and I'm still waiting. Well, let me, let me show you something that has had a profound effect on me. I did a little research, and I found that... Um, Cantaloupe. This one smells good, by the way. This cantaloupe, if you were to cut it open and take the seeds out, and then you were to plant those seeds at the right season, before you would see life come up out of the soil, 10 days would have to pass. It might be a day shorter, it might be a day after, but somewhere between 7 to 10 days, you're going to see a cantaloupe seed come up out of the ground. That's the germination process at work. But just because you saw the life spring up doesn't mean that it's time for the fruit to be taken. Because it would be another 90 days before you could have another one. 90 days after the 10 days. You're going to be waiting about 100 days from the day you plant a seed until you see a cantaloupe produced. Farmers know this. Tim knows this. Dixie knows this. Now, if you had lettuce seed, which, by the way, there's no seed inside this lettuce head. The seed comes from the bloom. It's a little different than some of our other products here. Lettuce seed. If you had some and you planted it, the germination process for lettuce, two days. It comes up quick. Put it in the ground, boom, it's up. Two days. You're seeing life think, whoa, it's about to happen. I'm about to get some lettuce. Well, no, you're going to wait 50 more days. It came up quick, but 50 more days. Hey, that's shorter than cantaloupe. 50 more days until you get a head of lettuce. God has written into the fiber of creation this same principle. It applies across the board, but it applies in different ways. Two days and then 50 days. 10 days and then 90 days. Let's talk about pecans for just a moment. This changes the game. If you take a pecan and you were to put it in the ground, do you know how long it would be before you would see something come up out of the ground? It would be six weeks before you saw the first indication of life come up out of the ground from the pecan. Six weeks. 
But just because you saw that first little seedling come up <laughs> does not mean you got pecans. In fact, it's going to be a while. It could be 10 to 15 years before you see the fruit of a seed planted. Let's talk about something else that was shocking to me and yet very personal. <laughs> Let's talk about some bamboo. <laughs> now, there are a lot of different varieties of bamboo. This is not Chinese bamboo, but this is aggravating bamboo. Now, now <laughs> Chinese bamboo is different than other bamboo. Chinese bamboo grows from a, a nut that's planted in the ground. You plant that nut in the ground in good soil, and you water it, and you wait, and you water it. And you wait, and you water it, and you wait. Do you know how long you will wait before Chinese bamboo first appears up out of the ground? This period of time requires you being diligent at watering it, caring for its area, because you won't see anything happen with Chinese bamboo until five years have passed. Five years, that nut will be in the ground. Work will be happening. And in the fifth year, it will begin to come up out of the soil. And then when it happens, within six weeks, it will grow 80 feet tall. Bamboo's crazy like that. You can't always judge the life that is happening by the amount of activity that you see. There are times that you will plant some seed. You will sow some seed. You'll be kind to someone. You will be worshiping next to someone. You'll be sowing Seed in your family, you'll be loving a spouse, you'll be forgiving that person who hurt you, you'll be loving your children, and sometimes it will take not days, not weeks, not months, it will take years, possibly even decades, before what was planted in their heart comes up out of the ground and begins to bear fruit. It's not our responsibility to force the fruit to happen. It's our responsibility to plant the seed. Amen? Amen. From the overflow of our lives. Now, if that wasn't crazy enough about that old bamboo, Chinese bamboo, five years that seed sits in the ground, five years there's work happening below the surface you and I could not see. And when it grows, whoo, watch out, it's fast. 80 feet, six weeks. But do you know how long it takes for that bamboo to produce another nut? 130 years. That's a different timetable. That's a different timetable than you expected, than I expected. Sometimes you're going to be giving, you're going to be serving, you're going to be loving, you're going to be ministering to, you're going to be serving, you're going to be sacrificing, you're going to be giving out of what God has given to you, you're going to be giving your tithe, you're going to be giving some love, you're going to be giving some serving, you're going to pour yourself out, and God, in his time, the one who is the Lord of the harvest will bring about what he said he will bring about because his word is always faithful. The seed that goes into the ground will come up out of the ground. It might not happen in the timetable you want, but it'll happen in the timetable he wants. That's why we don't give up. That's why we don't lose our faithfulness. That's why we keep doing what he's called us to do. We plant, we water, and we wait. And we wait, and we wait, because we trust 
our God. Isaiah 55, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth in bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Listen, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it will prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Amen? Amen. Yes. You can be sure if you're planting right now, if you're in the season of planting, you just need to stay faithful because God will bring about the season of harvest. He will. The question is, are you doing that? Are you sowing? Let me show you one verse from this passage we finish today. The Apostle Paul, so brilliant, so wise, so masterful in bringing together this whole concept of agriculture and, and bringing it over into the areas of faith. You get down to the end of this, this chapter in this passage here, verse 15. He, he kind of gets caught up and he gets all, I can just imagine him getting excited while he's writing it. And he gets kind of emotional and he has this sentence ends it. He says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. I think he's talking about Jesus here in this moment. I think he's also talking about this incredible design that God has woven into the fabric of creation. Mm. That out of the overflow comes the seed for new life. And Paul gets caught up in this. In this sentence here, he uses this word indescribable. If you do a little uh, writing history here, you'll find that this word shows up here first before it shows up in any other writings. It's a word that many believe that the Apostle Paul himself coined right here, that he came up with it, that he wrote it. No one else had used it, but many others later did. Indescribable. Something that can't be described. How about that? A word that means you can't describe it. It's kind of a weird thing. And Paul writes it here and says, I'm just so grateful to God for this indescribable gift that he has given us the gift of his son, the gift of this whole process of life coming through overflow and multiplying life in this way. I'm just so thankful for this. I, it's, just, it's just indescribable. I don't even know what to say about it. <laughs> Paul, in this moment, had a, a moment of overflow. It was something he had never written before. I've never written the word indescribable before. I think I'll write it. And he did. And it became something because he let what was inside him overflow out of him. And the word became life to us all of a sudden because it came out of his overflow. You have had God do things in your life. God has worked. He has shown you forgiveness. He's shown you mercy. He's loved you. He's provided for you. He's done, he's done so in some remarkable ways. And I know 21st century Americans like to say, well, I just don't like talking about my faith too much. I mean, you know, that's private to me and all. It just kind of gets me emotional. I just like just keeping all that. Mm -mm. That's, not, that's not overflow. That's you being sparing. That's you being fearful. That's you being too private. You're not letting fruit come forth in your life. And if you don't let fruit come forth in your life that has a seed in it, there won't be anything that comes from it because the overflow happens from the life that's in us and that's how life is multiplied from the overflow. So the Apostle Paul gives us this beautiful challenge here, this beautiful calling for us as believers You've been given so much. Now, because of what's in you, let it overflow from you. Don't keep it for yourself. Let it come out in your words. 
Let it come out in your attitude. Let it come out in your actions. Let it show up in your home. Let it be part of your conversations. Let it affect the music you listen to. Let it affect the places that you go to. Let it affect everything about you. Let it affect your money and where it goes. Overflow. Honor the Lord. This is how life multiplies from the overflow. Is God speaking to you this morning? Has he been specific about some areas in your life where he's saying, you know, I have worked in this area of your life and now it's time for you to overflow. It's time for you to live out what I've poured in. It's time for you to trust that I will bring forth the fruit in its time because God's word never returns void. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, this morning, we are overwhelmed at the power of overflow. What you have written into the fiber of creation. We are so thankful that out of your overflow, you gave to us. You gave your son. You overflowed your joy, your peace, your passion, so that we might experience it. And then you call us to that kind of life as well. You call us to be ones who now overflow. You call us to surrender our lives, to give out of what you've given to us, for that to be true in our marriage, that we might give not because of what we'll get back from someone else, but out of what you've done in us. And when two people in a home live in that way, there is incredible joy. Father, you've called us to do that very same thing in our parenting. Out of the overflow, we love and train up and raise our children that they might love you. Out of our finances, out of our worship, all of that, Father, we give back to you because you've overflown that life in us. I pray this morning we will stop resisting, stop hanging on to, stop clinging to, stop being private and start being public about what you have done in us, that we might truly be a people who have rivers of living water flowing out of us because of the life you've poured into us. For this, we're grateful. For this, we surrender. And for this, we now live. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What an incredible message that was. Thank you so much for joining us. Make sure you follow down below and join us next week as we conclude our series of Seeds of Thanks.